Okay, now we are continuing our course on computational GABA analysis. And since there was a relatively large uh, gap between the last session and this session, I don't continue with the last session, but rather uh, refresh things. Um, and hopefully I'm not having too many gaps. So uh, the thing that the routine that I've prepared for today is uh, called number 10. This is not really chronological order, uh, but uh, in order to show you right at the beginning uh, how I'm collecting all the files. So this is some other trick, internal uh, NUHAC trick. I um, have a routine called FDEP fun list, which is based on another routine of MATLAB. And I can even within the file, I can call it and it will say, well, what are all the files that I need uh, to, to uh, work to, 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 to do these things. So on the, on the one hand, and that's what I am not sure uh, uh, if I have it already available on, on the right hand side. Yeah, okay. Uh, I can show you that what I'm really doing is things, once I have this list of names of files, I can call the routine zip list. And it says, well, should I write all these data into a particular directory? I'm saying yes. I'm overwriting it and then it collects all the files as I'm using it in my MATLAB command. And uh, you see there is a name of a file in a standard directory. And this file is the one that I put and make it up, upload it. So on the other hand, we can take now a quick look at, at the routines that are used here. Of course, uh, the file in this case, I, I have to the use itself, or the file itself will be used or any other routines like my standard file for uh, adjusting axis. X20 means if the plot of a boxcar function is uh, uh, reaching the limits, then I, I will uh, make a, a little bit room and make axis tight, or I don't know, I, I'm too lazy to, okay, to do it clear command, or I want to have all the divisors, so we can do this div square root of n, say, well, what are the, all the lattice constants which are not too big and not too small? I think these are the lattice constants which are less than square root of n uh, and larger than a quarter of square root of n or so. So all div would be uh, all the possible divisors and uh, they are the very small, the very big ones or so. Um, today, I want to go a little bit in the direction of what can we do with uh, different lattices and lattice constants and so or you're giving me a group and I want to have the dual group. So which is the set of all pure frequencies, two dimensional pure frequencies, which are orthogonal to the given one, which means they have a scalar product, which, uh, they, 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 which are constant one on the original one. So if you write it as e to the i, two pi i, you get something in the scalar product, which is integer and e to the two pi i plus something integer is of course one. Uh, F2 spec is also something I'm using quite often to compare two functions in the spectra. Or if you want to see the Gauss, uh, the Gabor function, the atom, the dual atom, and the tight one, both in time and frequency, I'm using this F3 spec as an Fn spec. Or I have an operator and I want to get the eigenvalues and not the diagonal matrix containing the eigenvalues. And I want to have them sorted from the big to the slow one. So you get this. So these are all the routines. And it's maybe interesting uh, to check that which one of those routines you might want to use or you have not seen. Uh, yeah, we see Gauss in case creating a discrete Gauss function. Image C is the centered uh, uh, routine or going from the MATLAB to the cone nierberg symbol or from the MAT laboratory matrix, sorry, matri matrix to cone nierberg or spreading function we have this seen. And there are a few things with NUPS and so on. Okay, the, so the gap init routine is another routine, uh, which is I think even part of my Kickstarter. So it's just saying, well, now we have a redundancy 1.5 or so. But a new one, uh, which I um, might be interested, interesting for some of you, is uh, the following um, plot. So if, if I'm saying, well, 
what are the interesting lattices? Then, of course, the interesting lattices are the ones where the redundancy is not too bad uh, and where uh, the condition number and the quality is OK. So uh, how can we get a landscape of all these condition numbers? Uh, so here on the right hand side, you see all the possible divisors. And if you think in a standard mathematical way with x and y coordinates, you should think of this point or this line representing all the ones where the vertical lattice constant is two, and the horizontal lattice constant is two and three and four and so on. So remember, on the right hand side, we have the numbers, this divisor number one, two, three, four, five. And on the uh, on the plot, uh, in this plot, we have pairs. So of course, this is now the biggest one. So this is 240 and 240, which is a lattice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could also show you. Uh, yeah, we, have, we, have, we know how, how this lattice is look like. So uh, maybe it's just I'm saying lattice points is lattice points N, A, B. And uh, we have learned that uh, there is an adjoint lattice. I call it lambda adjoint, which is a standard routine. You can do it for any lattice of the lambda, but it's in fact just, so this is the same as the lattice with the lattice constants N over B, N over A. And uh, the idea is that uh, the dual group, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm doing this also, comp norm, the command uh, dual group of lambda is the lattice points with N and N over A, N over B. So you see in the case of the dual group, you're just taking the complementary divisor. Uh, and in the case of the adjoint lattice, you also then swap the n over b, n over a, they swap their position. And you can say that essentially, if you take a, a, a Dirac comp a point, I mean, unit pixel, so to say, at the positions of the lattice, you get the dual group by applying the two dimensional FFT, and you get the adjoint lattice by applying the symplectic Fourier transform which is a Fourier transform row wise and this uh, a forward Fourier transform row wise and inverse Fourier transform column wise, or maybe the opposite, I'm not sure. And then you are doing a transposition. So you change the roles and that explains very clearly why you have this. Okay, so let's go back uh, to this. So uh, what are these black points here? These are the pairs where you have the biggest with the smallest. So this is two times 240, and this is 240 times two. Well, how many points do you have? It's exactly 480. And if you go through all the other ones, you see that as you, uh, I don't know, you can take three times 160, or you can take, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, six times 80 or so, or eight, uh, 80 times six. So um, along this point, you find all the points or all the lattices which have 480. So what does it mean if you look at this landscape as a function? I mean, if you would plot the number of points of the lattice corresponding to each position here, you would have, um, I mean, here you could say, I could put A equal B equal one if you want, and you would have N squared point. So the redundancy N, and here, but here it's just n over four. And here you have four points only, so redundancy is, is four over n. So you see the redundancy is going from very high to very low, and it's reaching the critical lattice here. Now you can also ask, well, if you're going from the lattice, uh, you pick any point here, and you want to know what is the joint lattice, so then you just have to uh, reflect along the, well, let's, what is it? No, you have to reflect along the, yeah, I think you have to reflect along the critical line. So at least all the lattices which are candidates for Gabor, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm also showing you this. What is the rank of the Gabor base family 
for a Gaussian atom or with A and B. Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, maybe I should should take another example. I should say, well, if you would take, uh, I don't know, uh, 24 squared, and let, let's, no, sorry, Gauss and K, this should work also like this. Yeah. So what is 21, 24 squared? It's 576. So uh, why it, don't, don't you get a full rank? Uh, I don't want to explain the details, but it has to do with the SAC transform. So this is a critical lattice clearly because we have N over 24, which is again, uh, yeah, 24. So we have uh, exactly the right number of elements, uh, but um, we have a deficiency and there is a one dimensional space, which is perpendicular to the range of these things. And uh, therefore uh, you cannot span it. So let's say we could try to compute for all this, that, that's maybe a, a nice question. We could compute the condition number of the Gabor frame matrix for the critical lattice. Yeah, maybe I'm trying it here. For uh, JJ from one to 22, we have 22 lattices. Uh, well, I'm not sure, uh, maybe I first give it a name. Alf is all divisors of N for uh, and the length of alpha is the length, we call it L alpha, it's 22 of course. Now for JJ from one to 22, uh, I see, uh, see the critical, I compute the condition number of the Gabor frame matrix of G and um, half of N, uh, uh, half of J. So let this constant uh, number or divisor number J and and, and complementary uh, divisor is uh, N over this. Now I know this will be uh, big numbers, therefore, uh, Okay, now uh, maybe I should just show the numbers here. Uh, and you see that uh, this is in the range of 47, which means at least some of these things are, are really bad. And a very few of them, like the last one seems to be, yeah, well, no, it's the, that's the, so maybe we just take the log of CTC and you see it's, uh, uh, I mean, the log is, is in the order of 38, so it's a huge number. So the smallest guy in the whole collection is, uh, is, is six or so. So you see they're all terribly bad. And it has just to do that if you do discretization or periodization, then you avoid maybe the zero of the sac transform of the continuous sac transform, but you cannot be far away, especially if the N is large, uh, this is not possible. So what does it tell you? that in the landscape of all possible lattices, we assume that the interesting ones are the ones on the lower triangle, whereas the other ones are very sparse matrices. And there is the so-called wechsler ratz condition saying, well, if you go from the lattice to the joint lattice, if you have a good Gabor frame on the lower part, you have a good um, Ries basic or basis on the upper part. So then, the elements from the joint lattice are linear independent and everything is fine or so. So that, that's kind of an, a very important thing. And even you can check it uh, that the condition number, maybe I'm, I'm also verifying this, this is part of the uh, wechsler ruts So the uh, display, uh, which is uh, as a comment wechsler ruts condition, is uh, just essentially saying that the condition number of the Gabor family GAB, oh, I should show it to you, 
and the condition number of the Gabor family with respect to the joint lattice, which is now a linear independent family, and you do the gram matrix again, the same problem, uh, are exactly the same. So uh, even you can compute the upper and the frame bound up to some rescaling, uh, which of course disappears if you take the quotient is the same. So what are people trying to do in communication theory? Um, think of uh, Morse, you have short, short, or long, long, short, 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 long, long. Now communicating in a musical way, I'm playing an accord, another accord, another accord. You're deciphering the amplitude, you're doing frequency analysis and you find out what uh, the, the vectors of amplitudes are at a given time. If you're doing it too fast or if you're doing it um, uh, uh, at too fine scales, then you have no chance uh, to recover it. So that means that then your Gabor family is a frame and you have all these non-uniqueness problems. However, if you are on the other side, everything is fine. So I have to recall to you that once I, I was showing the so-called piano reconstruction theorem with the idea that if a piano player is playing, um, he has separation in frequency due to the uh, um, keys that he is allowed to, to hit. And he has separation in time because he is not a computer. And therefore, normally you can decode uh, the, the loudness of the, the individual frequencies. Okay. And so in communication theory, people are interested to have low or high redundancy, but still uh, not too high so that they can stably decipher. And the more sparse you are communicating, the less capacity has your channel. So the less information is going through the channel, uh, but the more reliable it is. So Morse would be more or less at this point, uh, whereas uh, modern communication schemes, schemes are working at this. Um, in Ga I'm, I'm concentrating now more on Gabor and you're on this side. So on the other side, uh, uh, there is this saying that the Gauss function is the best choice for a Gabor analysis. And this is true to some limitation in the sense that if you have no better a criterion and you want to have a universal statement, then of course you should choose a Gabor atom, which is both well concentrated in time and frequency, or which has a STFT, which is well concentrated in, in, in the time frequency sense. So we know this BGG, this STFT of Gauss with Gauss is a two dimensional Gauss function. That's perfect. You cannot have, uh, you do it, you cannot do it, uh, you cannot get the Dirac measure in this way. Okay, uh, but in some cases, if you have lattices which are long, or if there are reasons for musical signal analysis, for example, to choose windows which are longer than a natural Gauss window, then of course you are, have to choose lattice constants which are longer, which give you a finer resolution in frequency or so. So then um, such pictures will, will change a little bit, but here I'm, I'm referring to the situation we choose a symmetric function, which is the Gauss function. Remember uh, that my Gauss function was made in such a way such that uh, it's a discrete Gauss function and the unitary Fourier transform leaves this Gauss function invariant. Actually, uh, there's quite some interest nowadays in discrete periodic functions, which are invariant under the distributional Fourier transform or under the discrete Fourier transform. But this is a side remark. Okay, so if I'm, interested in the elements which are uh, not too uh, uh, redundant, then I would choose my area of interest in the blue domain. Later on, I would also choose the elements which are not too eccentric because then again, I would be able uh, to get or only get uh, very bad Gabor frames. So then I'm asking, what does it mean the eccentricity well, this is the relationship between A and B. So a huge A and a large B would not be good. So the extreme case, of course, which is not part of the picture would be A equal one, B equal N. What does it mean? Well, you take uh, a Gauss function and take all the shifted versions of the Gauss function. And then you're uh, saying, well, these are N functions and they are linear independent, which you can prove actually but uh, only uh, in, the, in the continuous case, 
And uh, then of course you have infinitely many or so, but this doesn't work out uh, because um, there is uh, no bioautogonal system or so. So it's, it's really clear that all these Gauss functions are very smooth and a linear combination of shifted versions are convolving a fun anything, any function, any distribution with the Gauss function, which means the free transform will decay. So you're only able to represent uh, smooth functions in this way, so it cannot span the whole space. So the, it, especially it cannot be a frame or so. So these things here, the green people downstairs here are too redundant for me. The blue guys are too eccentric. So the red area, the red combined with the, with the uh, yellow one are the areas where I would say these are the interesting points. And uh, this uh, seems to be, I'm not checking it, this routine says, yeah, okay. Uh, the routine that I'm using here, I think it's called Varlat or, or Gen. It's a routine uh, that uh, uh, was choosing I mean, you can have the parameters. What is the maximal eccentricity? So in this concrete plot, the maximal eccentricity is four. The minimal redundancy are just staying a little bit away from the critical one. So it excludes the critical ones is 1% and the maximal one is 4%. So I think for creating GABR multipliers, so there are other reasons and so on. Uh, this is an interesting range, and you see this uh, number is uh, 48 lattices. And of course, you can uh, here, yeah, uh, you can uh, ask what these lattices are, and we will. I will show you a little bit how I'm doing the description of different lattices. So here you have once more this. Yeah, here here is the command varlat, and uh, and uh, now I'm not going exactly into this. So this is, yeah, you see varlat can be called with the input. You, you decide your minimal, your maximal redundancy, your maximal eccentricity, and whether it should, should produce a plot like this or not, but it produces an output. And uh, I just, you see that is uh, the list of all the divisors and so on, but, uh, I would say, let's only look at the first output, which is the lumps. Well, lumps is just a list of 48 lattices. These 48 lattices um, are uh, exported. So it's, a, it's a, a, a matrix of size 48 times three in our case. So it shows you that, oh yes, I can take lattice constants 40, which is quite big for a standard Gaussian. And uh, yeah, so can on the right hand side, we could say, well, what is the condition number of the Garber basic family with G and 40 and uh, 10? And you see it's, well, it's, it's not terrible. It's, it's 10 or so, but it's also not really nice. Recalling that if we would choose our standard case 10 and 16, it is, uh, well, very small, and you could say that the condition number of the Gabor frame matrix of G and 20 and so, so let's say and B is just this, which is of course uh, uh, the condition number uh, of the Gabor frame family squared. So the frame operator has a condition number, which is the square of the condition of the rectangular matrix describing the GABA synthesis mapping. Okay, so if I would display the full list lumps, I would get a list of all these things with the redundancy described on the right-hand side. Yeah, here you see, I'm just seeing, this is the standard choice. If I don't say any input or variable, uh, it, it does this and say, well, probably he wants to see this plot, so it's coming once more. Okay, now uh, this is giving you an insight uh, into the situation. And uh, I just want to quickly recall that in the standard case, we are looking at uh, the Gabor atom, its Fourier transform, which is the same. Here, apparently, uh, the F3 spec is using a slightly different convention. 
the F2 spec has the unitary Fourier transform here. Apparently, it's a different normalization. So it really just shows the F of T of this here. Uh, you can take the dual atom, uh, the, yeah, the dual atom or the Fourier transform of a dual atom, which up to scaling is just the uh, dual atom for B and A, so switching the role of A and B. But this is just because the Gauss function is FFT invariant. And you can get the tight one with the uh, tight frame, which means either you're applying the frame operator, which is positive definite to the minus one half, or you go to the adjoint family and you do this Löwdin orthogonalization trick. So the symmetric orthogonalization of a family with uh, n divided by redundancy. So with three, yeah, just how many points does my joint lattice have? Uh, it has, uh, it's just n divided by redundancy and it's n over b, n over a. So this would be the autonormalization of this. Now, uh, just uh, what we had already at the beginning, we can create the Garber frame operator by uh, first analysis applied to a row vector and then synthesis, or we can do a routine doing it directly and more efficiently. We can look at the same on the Fourier transform side. And here I'm using the F, the Fourier matrix in its unitary form. F u is F of t u of n, which is exactly F of t of i of n, which is the same as the discrete Fourier transform, but normalized with the factor square root of n. Yeah, uh, we know that this is unitary, so the inverse is the F u prime. And so we conjugate this. That means if you start with the Fourier coefficients of an, a vector, you apply this matrix, you get the full coefficients of the output of that operator. So in our case, is this. Okay, now, uh, uh, so here you see that either I conjugate my Gabor frame operator with lattice constants A and B, or in this, this specific case of a full invariant Gabor atom, it's just switching the role of B and A. That's just a verification by this command. Now, uh, I want to show you some features that we have already observed. And because of numerical noise, I didn't want to make it perfect. Um, uh, when I do the spy command, uh, I'm showing you the structure of the non-zero entries. And it seems that there are some entries in this uh, matrices which are a little bit larger than the numerical precision. Let's say they are more than even 10 or 100 uh, epsilon. Uh, I should have taken a threshold, maybe 1,000 epsilon or so, but it doesn't matter. It just says, well, I look at now. What, what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you the support of the Gabor frame matrix and of the Fourier version of the Gabor frame matrix. So in my show mat routine, uh, yeah, I have this uh, command show mat four. Um, I would demonstrate uh, the matrix, the Fourier version of the matrix, the Kornirmberg symbol and the spreading function here. But here I'm doing something different. I'm showing you where the matrix is non-zero and I'm showing you the main diagonal of this one and uh, the main diagonal of this one. So what you observe is clearly this is concentrated on side diagonals. And now uh, I will do it um, pro separately probably is when, what, what is the distance between the side diagonals? And if I remember correctly, you can say, well, they're all together B side diagonals. So why do you see only such few ones? Because I was zooming in here. So there was a zoom command somewhere here. Uh, yeah, here, when the, this plot downstairs is produced with a sp spy in a centered way so that the zero, zero is in the middle and then do zoom three and the same with the Fourier version. Just this to make the, the structure more visible. So we see the main diagonal here and near the main diagonals there are some, some numerical noise, so to say. And the same thing is here. And what you can see here, uh, because the zooming factor is the same, here it's a little bit further away 
and here it's a little bit uh, closer. Now, if you do more analysis, here we have B side diagonals. So that means uh, that, of course, you have the main diagonal. The first main diagonal, the second main diagonal is this part here, but you should think of the full plot plus a little piece on the side here. So uh, my side digmat command uh, would be, uh, yeah, maybe I can do this here also. Uh, I'm doing section break. Uh, so I could do a comp uh, spice side digmat of uh, S uh, and side digmat of FSF. I'm not sure if it works, but uh, let's see. So I'm as a typo probably, and then once more, I'm showing you the, the structure of the site. Dig yeah, okay, but it, it, it's just fine. Uh, uh, okay, this, what was the command? FSF, well, maybe I'm, I'm doing it once more. FSF is a few times S times F U star. Maybe this was the problem. F U F. That's why it looks so similar. It was the same. Okay, come on. F U is F of T of U, F of T U of N. Now probably some variables are not available anymore at the moment here, but that doesn't matter. We can refabricate them. And uh, what you see here is there's again the same numerical noise, but it's side diagonals at a certain distance. And I was telling you, if you would count, you would see the distance is n over b, so you have exactly b side diagonals. Now the role of here, how many would you have here? It's uh, the complementary, so it's n over the b is taking n over a, so you have n over a, which is now smaller than n over b, uh, than b, so you have n over a uh, side diagonal. So we have uh, on the left hand side, I'm claiming that we have uh, b side diagonals, b, and in the other case, we have n over a, which is now taking the role of the b. Uh, in this, and uh, no, uh, yeah, and, and the probably I have to check this. <laughs> it, it it cannot be that. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. No, it's right. I'm getting. 24 side diagonals. So that means I have more side diagonals, which of course means that their distance is smaller. And clearly the distance is A here, and it's N over N over B here, N over B. Uh, yeah, just let me check. Uh, um, uh, A and N over B. Uh, N over B is of course uh, uh, larger. So here they are at distance 30, and I'm getting 16 of them. And the right hand side, I have 24 of them, and they are at distance 20 only. So, yeah, okay, so this is the structure. Now, uh, I could also have done or have prepared uh, some information about the adjoint lattice. So, why is the joint lattice playing such a big role? Well, first of all, the Gabor frame operator if the input is a group, that's important. It doesn't have to be a separable lattice, but if it's a group, then the joint lattice is the set of all time frequency shifts, which perfectly commutes with the original one. And if you recall the rules for a commutation of time frequency shift operators, you see there are phase factors. And these phase factors, uh, are exact giving some exponentials, and that's where this symplectic form comes in. So that's why you, you have to use somewhere the symplectic Fourier transform. So what I'm showing you now is, um, I'm, I'm 
hinting towards an important thing, which is called the Janssen representation of the Gabor frame operator. So what is it? Well, first of all, I'm doing a naive thing, an experimental thing. I'm saying, well, let me plot the adjoint lattice. As I said, this is the lattice with the uh, complementary divisors uh, in flipped order. And uh, then I'm plotting this in the red points. And then I'm plotting in blue stars the values where the spreading function is concentrated. Now what you see is that uh, essentially outside of the blue area, it seems that we are below some threshold. So the coefficients are so small that they disappear. You could take a random window instead of a Gaussian, and then you would see this uh, being um, uh, the blue dots more or less everywhere would fill the lattice. If you take another function like a, a higher threshold, it, this would be smaller. If you take a broader Gauss function, this would be more like elliptic. So you see this is like a discrete area in, in the 2D. And this is to do, of course, with the fact that the VGG, the STFT of Gauss with Gauss is in terms of absolute values, just another Gauss function of two variables. So you see that, oh yes, it seems that the spreading function is concentrating on the adjoint lattice. So it's a linear combination of time frequency shift operators. And here you again have luckily just 43 of them. So you could say, well, then instead of doing this complicated STFT analysis or so, you could just try to find out what is the inverse of this and go for finite dimensional approximation. Now, uh, if you just remember that the coefficients have something to do with the short time free transform of GG, so I call it VGG, the, that's coming from Corbett theory, the voice transform of G with respect to G. So this is the full short time free transform as you heard, it's not rescaled. And then I'm saying, well, Maybe I just have to multiply this bump function, this Gauss function, VGG, with uh, the lattice, with the joint lattice, and I get the spreading function. And then you see, oh yes, it looks good, but up to redundancy factor. You can do this, of course, for any lattice. So if I correct it, then I have it exactly. So what does it mean? I can take um, for a synthesis of the frame operator also for an analysis in the understanding of mathematical analysis of the frame operator, this is a very valuable representation. So uh, again, maybe I'm going back. This representation I forgot to mention here is uh, related to the Volnert representation. So the Volnert representation says, well, actually it's really just a diagonal operator, which is having such a profile and this looks periodic, and in fact, it is periodic. And you can check that this is exactly the periodization of the square of the window. So you take the Gauss function, you square it, that gives you the, the, um, the window. And maybe I should uh, do an interlude here, also one more. Uh, I, I could take uh, the uh, Sha which is uh, well, a vector of length n, which has a one at one to a to n. It's one. And now I'm taking uh, uh, a convolution. So I'm saying I'm taking sha uh, g2 is, well, I know the convolution of a real value Dirac comp uh, with something real value, it will be real value. So I um, do this for a cleaning purpose. I'm doing FFT of sha a, also I know that this is another Dirac comp. And then I'm doing a convolution, which means I'm doing pointwise multiplication with the free transform with the Gauss function. Also, I know that it is we transform. Uh, and then I'm plotting it. Uh, 
Okay, I was a type of Sha Ag G2. And you see it, it looks very much like this. So let's do a norm, comp norm main diagonal, which you can say is the diagonal of the Gabor frame matrix, of course, but then directly Sha G2. And hopefully everything works fine. Oh. Mm. Oh yeah, I see what, what has been, uh, there has been an error, but it's good that we see it. It should be Gauss function absolute squared. Uh, so that should be more spiky. And then you see it's everything is fine. So up to a normalization factor and this normalization factor looks like uh, B or N. Let's do it once more. And uh, oh, this was wrong. Yeah, maybe this is. I should do the correction on the for on the first time, but yeah, here now it's perfect. Yeah, so you see up to a uh, exp I mean some some computable thing that you can do, and of course. Uh, uh, this is true for any any window. And it's one of the reasons and that's why I made this plot. Why is a matrix a Gabor frame operator far away from the identity? Well, even the deviation at the diagonal is a big one. And in this case, I tried to take uh, decent redundancy. So the A and the B are comparable, but they are different. And you see, I took the plot of the same part of the main diagonal so you see there are more oscillations, so more oscillations here. Why? Because here it's A periodic. The role of A is taken by N over B and that's uh, this here. And that's apparently why, why these numbers play a role. So um, in a discussion uh, for a paper nowadays, we are trying to see what can be done by doing a so-called preconditioning. So we are saying, well, if you take the Gabor frame operator and you multiply with the inverse of the diagonal matrix, a very cheap thing, or the inverse of this matrix, which is a convolution operator, we can already get a very good approximate dual atom, uh, which means a, a, a function, which if you use it uh, for as a replacement for the original one, you can uh, get, um, a good approximate recovery of your signals. Okay, so, but I wanted to mention that, uh, whereas the Volnett representation says that a general matrix is summed up by this, it's bet much better to say, look at the, at the frame operator, it's constituted from the elements in the, in the blue, in the blue area. And if you only take the modulation operators, which have no time shift, so these, uh, so it's uh, nine in the vertical line elements. And then you are constituting the, the main diagonal. So you could say, let's try to do this. I'm not doing it now, but you can also get the main diagonal of the and free transform by changing time and frequency. And then you would say, essentially those seven frequencies um, uh, provide the main diagonal of the Gabor frame operator. So, cleaning up uh, on in this representation and preserving the structure because uh, that's the trick of Gabor uh, preconditioning is they're all in the same algebra. All of the elements that we are doing are elements having this representation. And if you combine two such functions, which are time frequency shifts operators from a lattice, they will recombine to another linear combination of time frequency shift operators. And uh, the rules that you have, how the coefficients behave, is the so-called twisted convolution, but that's going too far now. But the point is, um, by this yeah, experimental uh, evidence, we can say, well, it seems that we can compute the frame operator. Now, I have told you already here, and the plot is quite instructive, I hope, that uh, the number of points which are relevant is only 43. 
And so, of course, you, you think that if these are the coefficients coming from a centered Gauss function, the biggest one is this here. So this is zero in the continuous viewpoint, but it's one, one, or in MATLAB coordinate one, the value is one. Well, what is it? It's the correlation between G and the non-shifted, non-modulated, so it's identity against G. So it's G against G, which is norm of G squared. And we have uh, chosen a G, which has norm one. So this is why you get a one here. So if I take the sum over all the values that are relevant here, that's non-normalized again. And I think for this purpose, it's good to have nothing normalized. Uh, so we would get all the blue values and they sum up to 1.44. Well, what does it mean that you have so much of the identity operator one and the rest, the total sum of the coefficients is less than 0.4. And so if somebody tells you you're in some algebra of operators, either on L2 or even in some other function spaces like a zero or so, and the sum of the remaining one is only clearly far less than one half even, then this operator will be invertible and everything is fine. And uh, I think we should uh, take a short break now and then I will uh, continue with my explanations. So uh, 